So uh, today, uh, my topic is um, from Microsoft Excel to modern analytics platform, the predictive analytics perspective. So um, before I go to the contents of the presentations, yeah, I want to ask these questions. Do you guys know uh, what is analytics? Or a more curious and more concerning question to most of you is uh, what is data scientist, right? Because I'm sure you all have been hearing about the position data scientist. Yeah, it's the sexiest job in the 21st century. <laughs> and uh, how much money you can earn as a data scientist, right? Yeah. So um, I think the better, uh, the best way to answer all question is. Uh, by giving you a brief history of my uh, personal professional journey. Yeah? I've been working in a data mining area for more than 10 years, but I was not a data scientist before the year 2014. Okay? So uh, let me give you uh, some idea okay, before I go to that. Okay, so I did some uh, Google search. A data scientist is a job title for an employee who excel at analyzing data, yeah? Particular, particularly large amount of data to help a business gain a competitive edge. Yeah? So uh, now is the right time. Yeah? In Malaysia, uh, we need uh, a lot of uh, big data scientists. So uh, two months ago, our higher education minister, Dr. Sli Idris Yusho, he mentioned that uh, between the next five years, we need uh, 12,000 big data scientists to spur Malaysia's data-driven economy. Yeah. So I agree with that statement, except the number. <laughs> we don't need that many data scientists. Uh, we need maybe like uh, 5,000, yeah, not 12,000. Okay. So uh, let give me uh, give you a brief overview of my uh, professional history, how I got into uh, data science uh, industry. So uh, my first job after my graduations, I was working for a robotics company. Yeah. So I was not involved in any hands-on engineering works. Instead, I was asked to solve a problem. Yeah. So uh, my problem uh, was to I uh, was asked to develop a mathematical model. Yeah. For an industrial robots, and uh, I, the key objective was to uh, collect the uh, actual position of the robot and perform robot calibrations. So what is robot calibrations? Yeah, you can refer to that. It's the process of identifying the uh, real geometric parameters in the structure of a robot. Yeah. Okay, so I have to build a model and uh, which can estimate the error that exists in each joint and each link. Okay, so when I've done that, I will deploy it into the control unit. Just the control unit. So, uh, with regard to business problems, yeah, with uh, more accurate calibration algorithms, okay, the company will be able to you know improve sales, right? Because we are a robotics company, we sell robots. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the Chris uh, Data Mining Circle. Yeah. So uh, for solving a data mining problem, first you start out with a basic business understanding yeah, what kind of problem you want to solve. Okay. Then you will understand the kind of data that you have in your organizations. Okay. Once you uh, find out the data that you need, you need to prepare for it. Okay. After that, there is a modeling process. Yeah. So you can use different types of model. You can have uh, classifier, clusterings, or um, associations. Yeah? Different types of algorithm that you can use. Yeah? And once you have finished, you need to evaluate your model. Yeah? Make sure it's an accurate one. If it doesn't, okay, if the model doesn't answer the business problem, yeah, you have to go back to the beginning, which is the business understanding. Yeah? Go back to drawing board and start all this process start this process all over again yeah so once you have a steady model okay then you can deploy it into production okay so in my first job i did the same yeah the process is the same okay 
So, but I was not a data scientist. They gave me a very cool name, right? <laughs> Robotics engineer. Okay, but I accepted it. It's quite, quite a cool name. <laughs> then my second job, I was asked to um, do some uh, text mining uh, work. Yeah. So given a very big matching corpus of Malay and English, so I don't have a Malay and English uh, picture. Yeah. So I use the English and Hindu. So the first problem is I have to find the matching sentence pair. Yeah. So I have two large corpus. One Malay, one English, another one, uh, you can assume this is Malay. So the first uh, objective was to find the matching sentence pair. Yeah. So once I found them, yeah, I was asked to find the matching words and phrases. Yeah. So the reason my superior asked me to do that is because we have a machine translation engine that's in production. Yeah. So we need to find all these new words, phrases, pairs, and then fit that into the system. Yeah. Okay. So uh, business problems. Okay. By using uh, this automated alignment process, yeah, we are able to reduce the reliance of uh, manual extraction of matching pairs by linguists. Yeah. So my previous company actually uh, hired like more than ten linguists to do the manual extractions. Okay. So uh, by using this automated process, we are able to reduce the number of linguists to uh, like uh, two persons. Yeah. And then I was given another new title. <laughs> Computational linguist. <laughs> so, yeah, it was given by my boss, so I have no choice but to accept it. Okay, so my previous company is actually an AI company, yeah, artificial intelligence company. So, the main core businesses are uh, machine translation, uh, bioinformatics, and machine learning. Okay. So I was also asked to uh, help out in the genetic mutations uh, work. Yeah. Okay, again, I'm dealing with data. I was given another new title, bioinformatician. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Another work is uh, modeling of uh, irregular gating mechanics in nano channel. Again, another new title, machine learning specialist. <laughs> so this all this all this uh, my experience happened before 2014, right? Because the data scientist term only occurred in 2010. Again, uh, working for the same artificial intelligence company, I was asked to uh, lead a team, right? So um, so for this work. Um, we are trying to use data to train a uh, different robotic system to learn by itself. So it's very similar to the deep learning project. Yeah. And we provided a learning objective to robots. So the robot can be uh, hardware, software, or combined hardware and software. Okay. So uh, as you can see, this is a robot which learn to uh, walk while maintaining balance. Okay. So the robot uh, first started off by making many random movement. Okay. So any movement that either achieve the objective, we penalize it in the software on the system. Yeah. And in contrast, movement which achieve objective, we reward it. So we're using this kind of uh, reward and penalty systems or uh, the so-called reinforcement learning to build a self-learning robot. Yeah. Okay. Then I was given another new name, new title, Neural System Engineer. <laughs> okay. And then in uh, year 2014, yeah, I worked for a US startup. Uh, the company, the tech, the tech division is based in uh, Kuala Lumpur. Okay, so uh, the work is uh, central around building a credit scoring model. Okay, so uh, given the CRM data, which is the customer data, 
bank transaction, credit bureau data sets, real estate data sets. So uh, we train an accurate model, payment default. Okay, and then we deploy the model into production. So uh, with regard to business problem, without this automated process, we are heavily, heavily rely on customer sales representative to approve the loan applications. Yeah? And with the automated process, we reduce the time to approval. At the same time, uh, we increase the uh, volume of loan origination. Okay. So in this work, yeah, we uh, inject different types of uh, data sets. We have a web app that collects the personal data. We also call a number of credit services, API calls. Yeah, we also call social media data, real estate, consensus data, and so forth. Yeah. And then we use R to build the model, R language, and R to do the evaluations, and for deployments, we use Java. Okay, so uh, officially I was given the title data scientist <laughs> after so long. Yep. Yeah. So after a brief history of my uh, professional career, do you guys have any questions? No? Then we move on to the second part of the talk, uh, Big Data Era Introduction. Okay, so here are some uh, facts and figures on the vast volume of data that is available around us. Yeah. So 2.5 billion bytes of data is created every day. And 90% of the world data was created in the last two years. Yeah. And uh, more than 75% of the data is unstructured. Yeah? So when we talk about unstructured, we're talking about uh, text, right? textual data, like tweets. This is unstructured data. Okay, and Facebook processes uh, 500 terabytes of data per day. I'm sure this number is, uh, is outdated, right? Because Facebook now have more than 1 billion subscribers or members. Yeah. So this number keep increasing, keep increasing every day. Yeah, and all of these are possible except for our organization. Okay. So uh, whenever big data is mentioned, uh, these four V's come into mind. Volumes is the amount of data. Velocity is the streaming speed of data that comes in. Variety is the different uh, data sources. Veracity is quality of data. Okay. So when these four uh, we's are mentioned, then so people tend to start thinking about the technology to accommodate these four we's, right? So the technologies are such as uh, Hadoop, Spark, Storm, and uh, programming languages such as uh, Python and R and uh, Scala. Yeah. So we talk about their modern abilities to store and process all this data. But one thing is missing, right? Yeah. Is the business. Yeah. So more importantly is to be able to tell stories to the uh, businesses because big data is not a technical term. To me, it's not a technical term. It's meant to make businesses and organization more efficient and enable them to make better decisions. Yeah. So uh, we should put less focus on technology yeah? and put more focus on uh, great value for organization. Yeah, because sometimes even a very small data sets can bring value to organization. Okay. Uh, this is a difference, uh, some differences between traditional and big data analytics. Uh, traditional analytics uh, has been carried out for decades. Big data analytics utilize a lot more uh, advanced analytics uh, methods. Okay, and big data analytics often uh, involve analytics methods such as text processing, unstructured data mining, machine learning, and optimization. Okay. Okay. And you will also find that uh, traditional analytics deliver limited values, often in the form of uh, visualizations. Okay. 
and understanding what has happened in the past. Yeah. But whereas for uh, predictive analytics, we look at predictive, predictive analytics. Yeah. We tell organization what will happen in the future and how to make things happen the way they want it. Yeah. So these are the three major components of a big data solution. So the left part, which is advanced data management, has been around for a while. And same for uh, data presentation, data visualizations. So advanced data management, I'm talking about uh, data warehouse, web crawling, cloud web service, and so forth. And data presentations, yeah, I'm talking about like Tableau, uh, Cognos BI, Infographics, visualizations, reporting engine. Yeah, and lies at the core of big data is advanced analytics. Yeah. advanced analytics includes uh, text processing, video processing, sentiment analysis, and most importantly, uh, predictive analytics. Yeah. So whether your solution is worth anything or not, that depends on how good is your predictive analytics component. Yeah. Okay. And what's even more important is domain knowledge. Domain knowledge span across all three components. Okay? So it answer the question of uh, how to make each of these components compatible to your business. Yeah, if you look at this uh, graphical representation by Gartner, it quantifies the uh, percentage potential value that we can get out of our data at each stage of analytics. So now we are at the tipping point of diagnostic analytics, 2015, right? Year 2015. Whereby only 50% of the potential data value is realized. So to achieve higher, we need to go beyond that. Yeah? We need to go predictive and prescriptive. And it's expected to be a long process that go beyond 2020. So it's not too late to start now. Okay, and here are the some uh, typical analytical use, analytics usage, analytic use cases. So, um, first, uh, let's look at marketing response rates. Company use big data to measure and predict the effectiveness of a marketing campaign. The other one is a very common use case, uh, customer segmentations. What it does is to um, perform micro segmentation on the customer base so that a uh, tailored campaign can be carried out. And um, loyalty retention and lifetime value, this is uh, one of the most common use, case, use cases in the industry, right? Trying to predict and prevent the customer from going away. Yep. And last of all, we have uh, sentiment analysis. Yep. Sentiment analysis uh, allow the customer to to find out how the customer are thinking about their brand or their product. Okay, we have another table here. This is a table that summarizes summarizes the use cases for each industry. So the first column uh, show you the list of uh, industries uh, that utilize analytics to gain value. And then the, uh, the first row is the different use cases. Okay. So you can see that uh, fraud and compliance, marketing, customer analytics, these three use cases span across all industries. Yeah. And uh, based on my experience, marketing and customer analytics, they are the same, right? Because marketing department deal with customers related manners, yeah? And we look at uh, risk and fraud and compliance, right? So look at a few examples. Banking definitely need these two uh, analytics. Banking need to carry out. They need to develop credit score, yeah? So there is a subset of risk analytics. And same for insurance. So insurance company, they use analytics to predict insurance loss by customer. Yeah? And for government, it's also very critical. Government, you do the tax analytics. Yeah? 
So they need to uh, predict any, whether anyone is committing uh, tax fraud. Yeah. Okay. So I think I have uh, finished all the boring stuff <laughs> in my slides. So next I'm going to show you uh, how to develop a churn predictive model. Yeah. First, I'll use a very uh, I'll use the Microsoft Excel. Right? To be sure, uh, most of you know how to use uh, operate a Microsoft Excel worksheet. Yeah. After that, I will show you how to do the same process in R using R language. And last of all, I will show you how to do the same process using our IBM SPSS model. Okay. So give me uh, one minute to pull up my. Okay, so what we have is a very small data set. Okay, it has 10,000 rows or 10,000 entries. That's considered very small, right? So um, this is a historical churn record. So this column is very important, loss to competitor. Okay. Okay. So this tell me uh, this set of customer, they are loyal customers, right? They didn't go to uh, our competitor. But we look at a customer with ID three nine nine five five. Historically, uh, he has churned, right? He joined our competitor. Yeah. And then we have uh, the following five attributes. Customer gender is the demographic uh, variables. Customer age is also region. These three are demographic variables. And then we have the total coverage and customer activity. Yeah. So how do we approach this problem? Yeah, I want to build um, a churn prediction model using Excel. The first step is I need to summarize the table. Yeah. So, um, by the way, this is the same table. Yeah. So, first thing is, I need to find out how many rows there are in the table. Yeah. So, if you are familiar with Excel, you can use this function, count A. Yeah. To count the number of uh, rows. And then same function, you can count the number of columns. So there are eight columns. Yeah. Then the subsequent step is to um, summarize. Yeah. Summarize each column. So uh, customer ID is a unique identifier. Yeah. So it's unique by customer. So I just put a note there. Loss to competitor. Yeah. So this is binary. It's only have uh, two categories, yeah. customer gender. Yeah. So if you wonder how did I, uh, how did I just summarize yeah, each of these uh, column, it's quite easy. So what you can do is uh, go to the column, copy the column. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure most of you guys know how to do this. I go to here. I paste it and then I remove the packet. Yeah, you see? I have a mail and came out. Yeah, so total coverage has uh, 13 unique levels from 1 to 13. And uh, region is west, mountain, east, southwest and Midwest, okay? So once I uh, come up with this summary table, 
I want to look at the distributions of each variable or each column. Yeah. Okay. So first, I look at frequency of uh, gender distributions. Frequency distribution of genders of customers. Yeah. So I know that they are M and F, male and female. Yeah. So I can use the count if statements and go to the columns and count how many entries are male, how many are female. Yeah. Okay. So this gives you a high level uh, summary of the gender column. Yeah. Okay. If I want to look at the continuous variable total coverage, then it becomes a little bit more messy, right? So total coverage, I need to go to the column and uh, calculate the number of customers. Yeah, and I put it into this tabulator format. Then I can calculate the average, the medians, and mode, and variance, and so forth. Yeah. I can even uh, calculate the 25 percentile and 75 percentile. Yep. So uh, now I have understand the data, yeah, the data sets. I can build a predictive model. Do you guys know any kind of predictive model that I could build using Excel? Do you have an idea? Are you familiar with uh, Excel Analysis 2 pack? No? So uh, if you go to your Excel worksheet, you will see there's this tab called data analysis. <laughs> so you can uh, run regression. So this is linear regression. Yeah. So I click on that. So I select my, uh, I need to define the target, right? I'm training something. I need to define a target. So my target is my historical churn outcome. So if you recall, my historical churn outcomes are categorical data. It's either yes or no. But I cannot pass this into the regression because the regression tool in Excel only accepts numbers. Yeah? So that's what I did here. I convert the Churn outcome into continuous variable zero and one, yeah. And then for input, I only select uh, coverage, activity, and age. There's a limitation. I cannot select gender and region, yeah. Because the regression tool in Excel doesn't accept. Category data, yeah. So let's do this, okay? So once I run it, it will return me an ANOVA matrix, right? This is ANOVA matrix. Okay, I'm sure you guys are familiar with a linear model. So I can build a linear model equations using this condition, yeah. So this is my y-intercept. So my churn probability is intercept plus this coefficient multiplied by the customer age plus this coefficient multiplied by the coverage and this multiplied by activity yeah. so there's a major drawback here i cannot select yeah i cannot select the category variables yeah so it's a big turn off right it's a big drawback okay so what if i use r do you think r can solve this problem So uh, in our language, are you guys familiar with our language? No. 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 Okay. So you guys can learn, right? You guys are young. <laughs> okay. So um, this is the R Studio. So you guys can download it. It's uh, very easy to use, very user friendly. Okay. So uh, first, I want to read the CSV file. I have the I have the Excel CSV file. 
Well, the, the CSV one I just show you in Excel. I, I save it as a CSV file, the churn. Okay, and then I read it using this command. So it's very easy. I just run it by clicking on the run button. Yeah. Now it has stored this table into the workspace. So if I type uh, log, we break data. Yep. You can see all my data are displayed here. Yep. And then you can do your data crunching or your data processing. Yep. So if I run uh, the second command, name, okay, if you tell you the uh, the column headers or the fields yeah, in the tables. Okay. If I do a summary, I run the summary function. Yeah. It actually tell you um, the distributions of all these different variables. Yeah. So customer gender, 5,071 are females, 4,900 are males. Yeah. So I don't have to do all the manual processing in Excel, right? I can use R, you will do the trick for me. And then next we run STR, right? So STR will give you the uh, descriptions of uh, each variable. Yeah. So customer ID is an integer. Yeah. Factor is the same as category, Yeah. the factor levels. Yeah. So let's say now I want to run uh, linear regressions. I um, I will run the GLM, which is also the logistic regression. So I only need one command, right? I need one command. Okay. So I do that. Okay. Ignore the message. Okay. You give me the same ANOVA matrix. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. So now I will build a model. Okay, the name of the model is LG Up One. Yeah. So uh, if you are familiar with uh, Java or R, you can deploy this model. This is you can save this as a binary model, and you can embed it in your web applications or your desktop applications or your local application. Yeah. Okay. So you can see that uh, using R, the effort is uh, very much reduced yeah, to develop uh, any model. Okay. So now next we move on to SPSS module, which is even easier to use, right? The small features. Okay guys, so uh, this is the SPSS uh, model console. It offers you a dynamics and graphical interface, so you don't have to do scripting or coding, right? So it makes it very really easy for uh, business users. So uh, first thing that I need is I want to uh, read in the data sets, the churn CSV file. So how do I do that? What's going on? Mm-hmm. <laughs> 